Hello, everybody. Terrence Lake, you here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. Today, we're talking with Greg Burns from Nature's Image Farm. Together, we'll be discussing the importance of why, doing the work that matters, what meat is, and so much more. You won't want to miss this episode with Greg Burns. Greg Burns, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Terrence. Can you start by telling us about your farm, what you raise, and where it's located? Yeah, we're based out of uh, Zanesville, Ohio, and we're uh, beginning farmers. We, my fam- my wife, and uh, we have seven kids. We uh, moved out from uh, yeah, thanks. We um, we moved out from Blacklick, Ohio, uh, back in and uh, in, in two thousand fifteen to uh, kind of get back to the land, uh, learn some. Uh, valuable life skills, and more importantly, learn alongside our kids because we're so many generations removed from all this. You know, we're not starting with um, any kind of a solid knowledge base. So we're, we moved out here uh, to the country to try to learn together and um, try to figure this thing called life out together. So just and, because, and so, and, where is Zanesville, uh, geographically speaking? Yeah, Zanesville is about 45 minutes east of Columbus, Ohio. So okay. Columbus being central, we're, we're just straight east uh, on Route 70 there. So we're more like east central Ohio. Okay. I've been through Ohio a couple of times, so I was trying to place it in my head. Yeah, we kind of we get started out here in the right where the, the Appalachian foothills start. Uh, we get real big, kind of start to get into the mountains are a little too, we wish they were mountains, but they're more of like just real large foothills, rolling landscapes. Um, and that's kind of where we're we're nestled in here. But we we started off in the city, and we were uh, we had raised garden beds, and we were trying to grow some of our own produce, and to to, to see what it was like to try to feed ourselves. And we, we we've done that for years. And when I mean we, I mean mostly my wife. And I was the the shovel and the wheelbarrow, and she had the vision and the <laughs> ideas. And you know we kind of worked together on that. Um, so she's she was the one who really kind of started um, down that road, and. Um, and as it kind of developed, it just, it's one of those few things in life where something clicks and you just feel a natural drawing towards it. And we just kept uh, kind of developing those ideas. And before too much longer, you know, you have a neighbor or two that catches on and they're doing the same thing. And you build a little bit of a, of a community with folks that are, you know, raising them some tomatoes and some peppers in their backyard. And then you start to kind of drift and your mind is like, well, I wonder what it would be like to to be on a farm where we had more land to actually raise more uh, and, and get closer to what we actually need every year. And as we you know, continue to have kids, um, that uh, the idea of being more self-sufficient started to really sink in later and later as, as we uh, kind of went on through that to where it was like, hey, what, what would it actually take to get out to a piece of land uh, to see if this is viable? And so that was kind of the early thoughts that we had about that as we're kind of developing these ideas. Um, I, I travel for work. I'm self-employed and have been for a little over a decade and on a, on a trip, uh, coming back from Connecticut, right at the Connecticut and New York line, uh, I got into a really bad car wreck and, oh, wow. uh, lucky enough to actually walk away from it. Um, I shouldn't have. Sometimes you have a point in life where something really dramatic or drastic or traumatizing or some of us are lucky enough to get a wake up call. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely one for, for me and one for us to where every day from then forward was a gift. And we were trying to figure out, well, if our days are numbered and we, there is no guarantee, what can we do? We know what, what, how should we be spending these days? What, what can we do to fulfill whatever purpose that we have in life? So we started to kind of question everything and reevaluate everything reprioritize everything. And the next thing you know, we're, um, out here on a piece of land trying to figure out how to raise all these animals and trees and, and bees and things like that. So how many acres are you on? So we're on pretty small acreage. Uh, our house, uh, the homestead is on five acres. Um, and then a couple driveways down, we have 10 acres. So we kind of have the, some of the farming nursery, comfrey nursery stock things are, and are over on the 10 acres. And then here on the five acres on the homestead is where we typically raise uh, our pork, chicken, turkey. It's where our bee yard is. Um, 
and then it's where all the playground is for the kids. <laughs> and by playground, you mean chores, right? Exactly. So you got to figure it out. You're a farm boy. <laughs> you, you know what I mean when I say playground. <laughs> well, that's the thing. When you grow up on a farm, and I, my family got involved in farming when I was towards my teen years. So I was a little bit less enthusiastic about when it started. But my younger brothers who grew up in it. They, they uh-huh. just have a, a joy and an excitement for the outdoors that I wish that I had growing up. Uh-huh. I grew up wanting to be Davy Crockett. I wanted to live in the woods yeah. and the mountains until I realized that meant no electricity. <laughs> At which point I said, you know, I'm not certain that I'm cut out for the wild man existence. That's, that's interesting that you say that because we, um, when, we, we, when we moved out here, we had five kids. Um, and during this process, we've had our last set, which is a pair of twins. So we went, we went from five to seven. And the cool thing about that is for, for the last several kids, um, they've all been home birth with a midwife, uh, things like that. These were the first ones born on a homestead and probably almost four generations uh, when I go back to my family heritage and also my wife's. So it's neat to be able to have a different, to drastically kind of shape how our family moves forward. But what's neat and what, what sparked that idea is when you mentioned um, the, the difference um, and the attraction or draw or, or kind of how it resonates is the, the, the younger kids, this is all second nature, playing yep. in the mud, running around with pigs, you know, collecting eggs. The, the, the typical homestead or even farm, farm life is just almost inherent in their DNA, whereas the, the older kids, they enjoy it and they have, a, they have a passion for it. But you can definitely tell there's a there's just a, 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 an inherent difference um, in, in, in how they resonate with it. So that's a, that's a neat point you brought up. Mm-hmm. Now, you made this comment on an interview you did with Tom Domeris, and you, when we did a little pre-show talk, you brought this up, and I'd love to explore it because it's so much of what this show exists for, starting with why. Why mm. is starting with why so important on a homestead? Wow, that's a that is a long, long rabbit hole, and it's one I love to spend a little bit of time on because most most people, when they start off on anything, they they have some idea of why they want to do it. Sometimes they're chasing the what, or they're chasing the romantical side of you know buying car hearts and wearing wearing plaid and splitting wood and looking you know like you came off a homestead. The it's, craft I mean, beer bottle a, has it on it, so why should I mean? I? I mean, there's a whole hipster movement based on, on all of these things. Totally. You know, so it, it's definitely, there is something inherent with man that wants to kind of get to these things. But unfortunately we're, we haven't really been mentally equipped to figure out how to get back to this point in life or this point in time, um, because how we live life is just so completely different. So it's really easy to get sidetracked, to get lost or, to put a plan of action in place based on the idea of, of being a bearded lumberjack with your family in the woods. And, um, and, and that maybe helps get the ball rolling and it helps get you started, but man, you gotta, if you don't check yourself before you wreck yourself, you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself unfortunately in transit of this process, um, with, with good folks that we know who are, have lost their marriages, lost their farms, um, their kids want nothing to do with them. The complete opposite happens when you start chasing some of these ideas without putting the time into really figuring out why it is that you want to do it. With us from the very beginning, our, our why was to try to get out to a piece of land to better understand ourselves, better understand nature, to be more self-sufficient. And I, with, with, with knowing that we'll never be completely 100% self-sufficient, but maybe build more resiliency to weather those storms and learn these skills, kind of kind of uh, rekindle the old ways. Um, that was our initial reason why we kind of went down that road. And in doing so, at, at, at that time, um, and, I, and I don't mean any disrespect by it, but I, I kind of drank the, the permaculture uh, farming <laughs> for profit Kool-Aid. Yes. And uh, I was I was next next in line uh, to to make uh, some really 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 bad bad choices. Luckily, you know I I'm blessed uh, to be married to a wonderful woman, who 
helps keep everything in perspective. And she does a great job of, of letting me explore these ideas and dreams, but she's, she's the common sense approach to it. And she can help paint a picture that I can't see because I'm almost blinded with um, all these things that I kind of chase. So we started off down this road and we just knew inherently the first thing that we wanted to do was start down a road where we had like long-term perennial fruits and nuts um, because it takes so much time to get those established. And so we kind of first went down that road and we got involved with like Mark Shepard. I chased him around for a few workshops around the country, <laughs> learned a bunch of really great things that are solid and they're true. One thing leads to another and you are finding all of these other forms of education and you feel like, oh, I, I have to have my permaculture designs, uh, my, my, my PDC, so I can teach people so I can make money, so I can get off of the road and I can do this for a living and get back to the land. And I need to have all these things in place. And, oh, wow, I can sell poultry and full time and make a living like Joel Salatin or anybody else. And you start all these things just feed into these mm-hmm. inherent desires of, of human um, and we're not really equipped on the other side to process all that, to really put a good plan of action in. And the next thing you know, you're, you know, you're looking at 15 pigs that you need to sell and, and you're, everything is torn up and you're not having fun. Uh, and, and everyone's kind of mad at each other and the heat's rising and there's a lot of tension and you're, you're strapped financially because you're running, trying to run all these separate businesses. And all of a sudden you're just like, what in the world? All of a sudden you just wake up and it was a conversation I had with my wife and I'm just thinking, you know, we came to the conclusion, what in the world are we doing? Why are we doing all this thing? This is not what we started off doing. And, you know, hadn't been, if it wasn't for the solid marriage and how honest we can be with each other, you know, if, if she would have just let me keep going down that road or if she turned a blind eye or if she didn't care, um, you know, this would have been a much different um, conversation, but I just kind of want to interrupt we're not on the same on page. Sure. Point. Because you brought up twice, and I think it's really worth mentioning, that really having that solid relationship makes all the difference. How would it, I mean, look at the old, the Little Huston Prairie books. Ma and Pa being able to balance each other out in their characters made them survive. Because without having the one person who kind of wants to explore more and the other person wanting to just say, hey, let's think about this before we do it, I mean, if, without that balancing factor, it's so easy to go off the rails. It's so easy to get trapped in your own explorations and go helter-skelter. Having a good, a good partner and a good helpmate makes all the difference whether you're homesteading or farming. Oh, it's totally. And I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I could get to a point mentally where I could appreciate all the failures um, appreciate where we feel like we've had some success if it wasn't for having that companion. Um, if I was just a single guy chasing after all these dreams, I feel like I would have crashed and burned within the first year easy. Um, because I, I it's, it's just, there's, and I, I can only speak for my family, but it just seems like there is a natural inherent relationship when two people come together uh, with the same goals and vision in place that one and one equals 10 in some situations where just me by myself, there's no way, no no matter, no, no amount of mentoring or counseling, um, or YouTubing or book reading or podcast listening could get me to the point to where you have the perspective and the hindsight to move forward and, and keep honing whatever this thing called life is. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm not certain, but have you read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves? I have not. Fantastic book, but one of the things I thought was interesting about it, and he talks about this in all form, he talks about specifically with friendship love, but it it kind of goes into romantic love at a certain point. All relationships that are friend-based, which arguably marriage should be, it starts with two people seeing the same truth. And that I think is one of the main indicators Mm. of whether or not a relationship will be successful is if the two of you are matched on, this is what truth is. And this is what we're pursuing. This is what our purpose is. And this Mm. is what we're talking about. It's that why being united in why allows you to go through rough patches. It allows you to reorient and go back to 
it, it allows you to focus when you're starting to get a little off the beaten trail. So I'm sorry, we, we kind of got on a tangent, but no, that's perfect. I mean, that's it, we're talking about Little House in the Prairie, and uh, of, of course, you know, most homestead kids are in love with those for the most part. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, so I sometimes get the, um, get them confused, but I remember there, there was an episode where Paul is at the, the, the grain mill and he's slinging and stacking up all these bags to try to make that little bit extra money because I think he was either in debt with something or he was trying to buy something to further whatever he, he, he was doing. And, you know, Ma, I don't know that she knew about that at first. She, I think eventually found out, gave him the slack to kind of see it through, but I think he ended up getting hurt and all these kind of mm-hmm. things. And it was one of the like most perfect uh, video visualizations of seeing all these things happen in life that we also do. You know, we started off and we're still carrying debt loads um, and, and things that we, you know, purchased back when we were chasing the American scheme that we thought was what we needed for joy and happiness. We're still, you know, paying that ridiculous idea off and paying interest on it. Um, and so now, you know, in this situation, you know, we're running other farm enterprises and things to help pick up the slack uh, to kind of recover and recoup from those mistakes. And, and if it wasn't for the fact that my wife and I are on the same page um, and our strengths and weaknesses balance each other out, there's we would have given up a long, long, long time ago. So, you know, that's, you know, having the same vision or the same idea of what that truth is, you know, may actually be, um, you know, the most important thing uh, to settle on first. And I don't, I, and to be honest, I, my heart goes out to men and women that are doing it by themselves because I, I don't know that I could have arrived to, you know, the, these ideas just by myself. There's no way. Now we touched on this a little bit earlier. I kind of want to round back to it, but we have a culture that wants the appearance of rugged individualism or rugged. I'm the outdoorsy person. Look at my beard, see my flannel, see my craft beer. Don't I look manly? It, do, what do you think it is? Is it that we just want the appearance of work of the what of what the work represents without the actual work itself? Uh, well, I've actually I, I definitely have spent a little bit of time doing that. Uh, when you have products that you're trying to market or trying to sell, and you look into you know, what what are folks interested in? What what actually drives them? What is what is there are some things if you have a craft IPA beer, which is delicious and you have a lumberjack splitting a piece of wood on it and you call it Homestead IPA and you set that next to a can of PBR, you know, most men in their thirties or mid thirties will buy the lumberjack IPA every single time and may actually identify with that appearance. Maybe might build a preference for that taste and it could be, it could literally be just trash water in a bottle there's there's definitely something inherent with us that we want to it, it's as we develop it seems like as a civilization and technology becomes such a crucial point in the evolution of how our brain interacts and reacts and learns there's also a lot of negative things that happen where you know when i was a kid if i wanted to if i wanted to google let's say how to propagate a comfrey plant I'd have to dig through the Britannicas and encyclopedias to even figure out what comfrey was, let alone figure out how I can learn to propagate it. Now everyone has the power in their pocket to do that. So we are kind of evolved into, if we have a question, we'll get an immediate response, an immediate answer. And unfortunately, with a lot of folks, is they're now immediately an expert in these fields. They will portray a certain picture based on their initial immediate feedback on that. And the whole world gets to see that. So the whole world gets to see is that, is that, you know, City Joe moved out to a farm and is successful and is making things happen in, in his life. And that goes through a whole mental process from the people on the outside looking in, feeling like that they're losing at life. When in reality, Joe just has a smartphone in his pocket. He Googled a couple things, takes a couple flattering pictures and puts them on Instagram. That sweet Instagram life. It leads... And all these are fantastic tools, but there, there are so many consequences. And one of those consequences is we've evolved mentally to always be looking for shortcuts to being successful. Mm-hmm. And I will go on a pulpit. My grandfather was a pastor. And so sometimes I can get a little long in the tooth 
on these things. So feel free to cut me off. But hey, you know what? My grandfather was a pastor too, so I, I totally <laughs> sympathize because I do the exact same thing. I mean, that's why I do podcasts. I mean, it's yeah, and it's one of the best ways to uh, to get that out there. It, one 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 very defining thought that has kind of reoccurred in our journey um, is that while there are shortcuts to finding success, there are no shortcuts to being successful. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants the appearance of success and they think they want to be successful. They think it's the same exact thing. So I want to be the next uh, urban farmer or market gardener or pastured poultry king. Therefore, all I have to do is get this knowledge before somebody else does. And I will be in that position of being successful or the, that, that portrait. And they're just, there's, there's no way to get to arrive at any kind of a, of those positions without X steps and X checks and balances and X thought processes. But we're geared for instant gratification, uh, instant knowledge. Um, and unfortunately that has some really negative consequences. You know, I was just talking about this recently with Scott Hebert, uh, who I believe, you know, and in fact, he recommended you for the show. So thank you, Scott. But, Thanks, Scott. Uh, we were just talking about this recently, and it's really been, I've been thinking about the same thing because I started binge watching Shark Tank, which for anyone that isn't familiar with the show, basically these entrepreneurs come on the show, offer a percentage of their company for a certain price tag, and they're trying to get the sharks like Mark Cuban, Kevin O'Leary, all these guys to invest in their business so they can grow, save it or whatever. But always the thing that is the defining factor is what are their sales. That determines whether or not a company is actually Mm. successful. At the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. You can have the perfect picture and image and marketing, but at the end of the day, unless your sales, unless the result of your labors prove that it actually works, then the company isn't worth the insane valuation that they'll put on it. And I think that's so true with uh, farming. I mean, uh, you nailed the head right there. It is, we've got a culture where it's so easy to take a photo and say, hey, look, I'm a successful uh, urban gardener or I'm a successful uh, homesteader. And people go, oh, wow, look at that. They're successful. But what they don't know is that behind the carefully cleaned up image behind them for the photo, the place is a mess and it's drowning in debt. We can't just look at the surface image at the end of the day. People like Joel Salton do what they do because they've proven their track record through doing the work and being successful at it. Mm. That's, that's, that's very true. My wife and I were talking and when you start off and you, and once you can actually nail, maybe nail, how about tack, tack in temporarily what you think your why is, and you feel good about that and you arrive at that, then there's like, there's some basic things that need to happen underneath of that umbrella before you get to the point to where it's maybe a truth in your own life, whether it's, you know, let's say uh, Greg and Susan want to start a bee yard, which we're in the process of, of developing our bee yard to, to kind of flesh these and this enterprise out, just like we have with chickens and turkeys and pork and nursery stock and the list goes on. If the fundamental why is clear and understood, then you can move forward. Moving forward from there, we have, you know, planning. We have, we kind of set a budget for whatever that it is. And then we have to to see, does it fit into our context? And if that idea fits those three things, the next thing that you have to do is actually start to put the work into these ideas or uh, the uh, this enterprise. But you have to do it in a way to where, Unfortunately, there are folks that will take a a workshop or they'll read a book and they'll go get a $100,000 loan because they are 100% sure it's going to work for them in their context. And they didn't even realize that the workshop is based out of Canada or it's in (laughs) Texas or it's in Australia. And they'll, they'll, they'll literally, before they even own a farm, they'll get a loan for the farm and put the whole farm on the line based on, unfortunately, ideals with some... Uh, some information and for, they can't get it to work and then they lose everything and it takes them the rest of their life to recover. If you start off a little bit smaller 
and you set a budget and you try to plan for it and see does it actually fit inside our context at a much smaller scale, flesh that idea out and do it three times, not just one time. You, cause we've gotten lucky once. We've gotten lucky, lucky twice. On the third time, next thing you know, you have a different uh, pig farrower and the pigs are way younger. It's a different breed and you have pigs that are all full of pneumonia and they're dying left and right and you can't figure out oh my gosh, I thought I was an expert in this. I read all these books. I took these workshops. This can't be. This, this cannot be. And then you blame everybody else. If you just, if you can keep the mindset to where everything that you do is a temporary uh, fleshing out of these ideas or these enterprises, give it enough chances to see if it actually works in context. Step back and say, okay, I ran pigs again for the third year. How's my planning doing? How's the infrastructure? How's the budget? Does it fit into our context? And if it doesn't align in those things, you've, you've got to have, you have to have the lack of ego or at least be cognizant enough that ego works too much in all of these things to say, hey, you know what? It does kind of work a little bit, but not so much in these areas. But people think I'm a pig guy or people think that I'm a chicken egg guy or I'm mm-hmm. to have the best pasture. You have to be good with saying, you know what? I'm done. Like you have to say, I need to adapt this and move on, learn these lessons uh, and keep trying to carve out what it is because I'm going to be honest, you know, it's okay. And sometimes the why actually develops and it evolves and it almost mm-hmm. changes yep. as you start to better understand that thought that you had to begin with. When all this idea was based on, we wanted to get out to the land and be more self-sufficient. It's hard to really pare that down and be any more brick and mortar than that. But as these things develop, you realize where you fit in, where you don't fit in, what opportunities exist, where it's way too challenging, where it's it's actually a liability. And then that can kind of adapt. But you have to be, you don't have, you don't have to be smart, but you have to be real lucky. And you have to be able to know that you always have an ego that's always working and that always needs checked. If, if not, you'll be in that situation where it's it's going to be ungood real quick. And I think I don't want to sound tacky saying this, but really, if you're living things grow, which means if your why is actually living, if you live your why, if your why is a part of your daily life, your why will adapt as time goes on. It will grow along with you. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and I'd love to keep going down this road because I, this is bread and butter for me. But I'd really like to start by change the subject a little bit and ask, what is Hogtoberfest? Because when I was doing <laughs> show prep and I read this, I'm like, oh, dear goodness, we definitely have to talk about this. So Hogtoberfest, as we started this down this road, we we started getting building relationships with local people in Ohio that if you can meet up with folks that are anywhere in a homesteading mindset, the that slight pool of people is so magnificent compared to how you would normally find people or you would find friends or, or build community even in your own area. So we started engaging with a bunch of local folks and we're like, man, these people are like, they're, they're friends, but they're almost like family. This is, this is a strange new development and like the social evolution of kind of who we are and what we are. And as you start to head down your road, chasing this dream or this idea, you continue to build relationships. And one thing that we kind of discovered is, is, is people are, are gravitating towards these ideas of we're not experts, we're beginners, we're not pretending to be, you know, some high class French charcuterie butcher shop in Ohio. <laughs> we're just a bunch of damn hillbillies that are trying to get back to the land and involve our community just in that and doing all these things. We realize, you know what? There's a lot of old time ways that we have really forgotten the, 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 the social get togethers. When, if you say a hog killing, most folks who aren't familiar with that are automatically squeamish and they're freaking out and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what kind Mm -hmm. of (laughs) satanic animal sacrifice is going on at your place? (laughs) Oh dear goodness. And they just have, you know, so we started as we started to build community in our area, just with folks that are engaging with us and visiting the farmstead and and kind of getting a better idea of how we are finding some measures of success. But more importantly, learning from where we have failed flat on our face. 
you start to build, I hate to say it because it's, it's definitely a cliche, but you start to build a little bit of a tribe or it just kind of grows mm-hmm. around you. And, you know, one of those opportunities that we wanted to put out there was, you know, when we are, are learning uh, to butcher our own hogs, we're learning with everybody else. If you want to come check it out and, you know, help us out and see what it's about, then you're more than welcome to. And it's, 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 it developed really almost too fast to where there's a lot more people that want to get involved with these kind of things, which is fantastic. But we started to understand that the idea of this or an old time hog killing um, or uh, uh, an old time get together and make apple syrup or, or, or applesauce or maple syrup, there is a certain inherent uh, social desire that man has, but also a, a need for community. And we thought, well, we're not experts. We don't know what we're doing. Neither is anybody else. Uh, even if they pretend that they are on, on Instagram, let's get together and have a good time. Let's let, let's learn all these things together and just kind of see where it happens. And that's and uh, actually Scott Hebert was out uh, a couple years back to kind of see what it's like here in, in the hills of Ohio, where there's banjos and there's definitely pig squealing and and the whole nine yards. And so over time, it's developed to it's kind of um, progressed into an opportunity for us to reach out to. Uh, some of our community to just continue to engage and catch up with old friends. But, you know, there's there's the Masanobu Fukuoka quote, and the end of it is just magnificent. But um, the, the, the short idea is once you, once you understand that the, the essence of natural farming isn't about growing the crops, but it's actually uh, cultivating and, and perfecting human beings, a light switch goes off. And when we understood that, you know, people don't really care how great our pork is or how, how, how awesome we can salt cure our bacon and smoke it in our smokehouse or how amazing our bees are or all these different things. What, what they're looking for is a way to be included in community where we can all learn at the same time. And it just goes back to the old time ways. So Oktoberfest, we do a couple other chicken butchering things, turkey butchering things. We make ma- maple syrup. When we work the bees, we always try to include um, folks, because the the truest, most honest sense of community, but we're not taking people's money. We're not you know, taking advantage of them. We're just, they're showing up, they're pitching in, we're helping out, we're having a good time. There's always, um, you know, something to, to do around here. And it's just, it's a nice way to harken back, rekindle the old time ways. And that's kind of what Hogtoberfest has developed into. That's really cool. I think it's great that what it is, is it is building that in what I'll say is a truer sense of the word, a tribe, because I think yeah. we easily do get, it, we have the, we have the Instagram quote version of tribe, and then there's the real <laughs> tribes. <laughs> right, right, and right, right. That is how you, I mean, really, if you think back, that is how communities were built. It is, especially in agrarian ones, which are totally. the basis of all communities. It is on, listen, I could try doing this myself, but it's better to do it with other people. And, we learn with each other. And I think that that's what's so awesome about this. Now, I, the next thing I have to ask you about, because why not? What is mead? Because I know what mead is, but I'm not certain that everyone listening will know what mead is. And how did you get involved in making mead? So me, yeah. Uh, first, mead is just a glorious elixir of alcohol and honey. And so uh, mead is just a... Um, it's a it's a honey wine that has ancient um, ancient ties to early man, uh, even going back to one of the meads that we make, um, and it goes back to maybe some of the earliest known recipes or earliest uses. Is there's the legend um, of Achilles, and when he would take his troop into battle before battle, they would drink a mead consisting of yarrow. And Yarrow, as you know, or most folks who are listening or if they're in tune with an agrarian lifestyle, they understand the, uh, the, an- the antiseptic and antibacterial properties of Yarrow. So they would infuse, they would make an alcohol drink using water and then the honey for um, the sugar part using natural yeast to ferment the water and the honey. But they would also infuse it with Yarrow and other herbs that would almost inoculate the troops with a little bit of uh, courage Mm-hmm. First and foremost, with the alcohol, <laughs> but secondly, they have yarrow running through their their blood, um, and so when they would go into war and they would come out wounded, they would actually then dress those wounds with that same mead, 
and then of course drink it as well to kind of help heal uh, and, and recuperate. So there are phenomenal um, medicinal qualities to meads, beers, and even wines outside of looking cool in a hipster bottle. Um, and so we kind of, we got in tune with mead, uh, a buddy of mine, Michael Jordan, who also is a beekeeper um, out of Wyoming. I, I would I would keep seeing uh, he, him post stuff about mead. And I'm thinking, well, you know what, what's mead? I, I understand it's some kind of a hooch. Um, mead is definitely out of context for our local heritage here mm-hmm. in Appalachia. Yeah, it's, it's, um, normally it's made of corn in Appalachia, if I remember correctly. And exactly. That, that's more in line with my family's heritage. And allegedly you can do some pretty phenomenal things with mead and getting in tune to some of those back in the hollow with a spring type of activities. Uh-huh. Uh, and you can turn mead into another super, super product. But uh, for me and my family's heritage, if I, if I go back, my, my brother ran our DNA and I didn't really know, it, but I guess we're primarily like Scandinavian. So I guess we have like Norse Viking running oh, through yeah. our genes as well as being Irish and Scottish. So we're like Irish, Scottish Vikings, which is an awful combination. I of, have buddies uh, that are Irish, mead, Scottish mead Vikings, so I do understand. Okay. All right. So that's, yeah. So you, you're, uh, you, you have a calling for like me and there's something that rings true about it, but then, you know, uh, a still in a hollow also rings true to, to your family heritage too. So, uh, so mead was out of context. You know, if someone, if, when someone says shine here, you know what that is or corn liquor, mm-hmm. folks have a pretty good idea of what that is. But mead, um, is kind of out of context. I've kind of grown to enjoy mead. Um, but it, mead is definitely not my favorite, um, uh, way to, to, to kind of brew anything here on the homestead, but that's what mead is. And one of the most important thing, what's where mead becomes more obtainable and when you can kind of discover that art is when you're, when you're a beekeeper and you can actually afford good quality honey to do it. That wasn't a big reason why we went down and started beekeeping, but it's really helpful when we can pull off a couple hundred pounds of honey, um, to experiment with, you know, a five gallon batch or a 10 gallon batch of, of mead or any other kind of hooch. When I first, so I actually used to do farmer's markets and I worked for an apple orchard that had bees and sold honey. And I still remember the first day I was at farmer's market and we had the huge, like the big 32 ounce honey. It, it, was it 32 ounce? 64 ounce, maybe. I think it was 64 ounce. It oh, was wow. the biggest honey thing you could get. It was like the size of a, a gallon bottle basically. And yeah. this guy walks up. He's like, I want that one. I'm like, what? And, and he just looked like this single Joe type guy. I mean, normally <laughs> not, Sally soccer mom might get that much honey to put it on her kid's cereal. But this guy is single Joe and single Joe's. I'm like, what the heck are you going to do with all this honey? He's like, I'm going to make some meat in my basement or my garage, man. And I'm like, "Mead? Wow. Really? Cause I had read about mead in the Viking lore, the Roman yeah. lore. And, I always just thought it was like this mythical drink of the gods, not a, uh, not an actual thing. So it was really cool when I found out. Obtained by real. man here in Ohio, there's, there's, um, a, a pretty big to do about, um, like the Renaissance era. There's a Renaissance festival and I think it's like a week long. And so when I think of mead, I think of, you know, the folks that are dressing up for, for in that time period and they're rather than drinking grog or whatever, uh, alcohol they they talk about mead in, in that case it's probably appropriate because we're talking about french and european influence but it, it mead just seems out of place for most of um our you know cultural heritage here in the u.s but it's an it's it's, it's definitely neat it's, it's a great skill to have um but to be honest man it's like you know even if you had a surplus of honey it i just it seems like there's well, I guess uh, I have w- w- with so many kids, you know, there's no way in the world I can burn through a hundred gallons of honey when there's other things, edible things, baking things, mm-hmm. making elderberry syrup, uh, yep. things that it seems like it's more, you can get more of the medicinal value and, and nutrient value out of the honey making other things. But I still enjoy mead. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great art. Um, and I enjoy doing other things with mead that is maybe more in line with my family's heritage. So you talked about bees, and you actually started a podcast recently, which we will link to in the show notes. Tell me about your how you got involved in beekeeping and what inspired starting the podcast. Well, once again, most of our great ideas around here are my wife's. And I remember when we were 
you know, I, bees are cool. And you're always thinking, man, that would be neat to be a guy who has enough bravery to have a beehive. I always, mm-hmm. there, there, for me, there's always been a certain amount of, of reverence and respect. Not later did I learn that I actually have a family heritage of beekeeping that I had no idea. My, my grandma was sharing us some stories before she passed away. And it was neat to understand that, hey, some of these things ring true in our life because they're, they're, they're dug deep down in our DNA somewhere. And when given the opportunity, they spring up. Um, and, uh, we were, we were driving, uh, at, at the time when we, we, we had a transition period from when we lived in the city to where we had bought land and we're trying to have a permaculture farm that was 45 m- you know minutes away from town. We started raising crops and went down this whole entire rabbit hole, which we can go down some other day. But on the way back, my wife said, we should get some bees. And I was like, you know, typical, any man who always has these like hidden ideas, like beekeeping or a motorcycle or a four wheeler, when their wife, when it's her idea, you're like, I, I, that's the greatest thing I think you've ever heard, honey. I think you're right. Let's do that. You know? So, so she mentioned it. And then it, it just, from there it was like, Oh, this, this could be a possibility whenever it kind of made sense. Um, I was asked to speak at a, um, a homesteading workshop, uh, in Ohio that my buddy Steve Harbolt put on. And, uh, we're just, you know, talking about our transition from the city to the, to the, the land out here. Um, and I had a, a, this really tall guy just walk up to me and was like, Hey, I think I might be interested in some of your pork. And I was like, Oh, well, that's great. Cause I'm interested in, you know, maybe selling some, he goes, would you be interested in, in trading for it? And I said, yeah, possibly. I said, why don't you just give me a call back here in, this, in the, the early spring and we'll see kind of where we are. Well, that was Shane McClellan. And he, he called me um, early spring and said, hey, I just want to throw it out there. I would totally buy your pork. But uh, for health reasons, I I'm, have to get out of beekeeping because I'm getting too allergic. Would you want to trade pork for oh. all my equipment and some mentorship? And I was like, uh yes, let's, that's awesome. So Shane, Shane actually was the catalyst that got us to having equipment and getting some early experience and some early mentorship. Um, and then from there, it was just one of those things that just resonated in some weird way, deep down inside that we're still, you know, learning to kind of, um, develop and discover. So we started our beekeeping journey and have learned a whole lot of things in a short amount of time. So we're starting a, a, a small commercial bee yard, where this goes back to our conversation of we have a why and we have to plan, we have to have a budget, we have to have context. Um, and so right now we're in that phase of finding where uh, a bee yard fits into all this. So we're growing our bee yard. We Last year we started off with six, six um, nukes, uh, got up to 20 by making splits and, and learning and, and having some really good mentorship. And um, so now we're going to keep developing these ideas. This, we're in our fourth year now. Um, and that's what kind of got us, um, into beekeeping and then doing so just like with building the, the local community, um, we've have built some, some local community around beekeeping and beginning beekeeping. Uh, and, and my buddy Dan and my uh, buddy, uh, Jimbo, we said, Hey, you know what? We're not experts. Um, but Jimbo started off year one, uh, Dan was in year two. And when we started, I was in year three of beekeeping. Um, and they approached me and said, Hey, what if we put a podcast together? Um, when we can just kind of share our experience. And so we kind of further develop those ideas and kind of what our goals were for the podcast. So now um, the three of us, um, we get on and speak to uh, the beginning beekeeping experience, not as the authoritative voice, not as somebody that has the answers, um, but we get on and have a good time of just sharing our beginning beekeeping experience with maybe folks that are have beginning folks that are on the fence or maybe even some experienced vets who just like to laugh of how, how silly some of our, our um, ideas are. And that's called the uh, the Contrary Beekeeper Show. That's awesome. Well, this is one of the things I think is great about podcasting. And really, for all the things we've talked about that make technology and modern life difficult for our brains, I think that one of the advantages, the key advantage, I think, is that we have this ability for on-demand radio, basically. And it allows Mm -hmm. anyone who's willing to put in the work to talk about what they enjoy doing and learning about and sharing that knowledge with others. And beekeeping is such such an art 
in its way. I, I don't know too much about it personally. I have friends that are beekeepers. And it's a, all of them, it, they describe it like a religious experience almost. Mm. Yeah, definitely. There is, there's, a, a, there's probably a f- very few, I'm, I'm only 36, so I'm only speaking to being a young timer that has a reverence for the old time ways. But there seems to be a few things in life that have some kind of connection that definitely feels greater and deeper than what we tend to see on the, on the, on the, the surface of things with beekeeping. We've taken a, a European honeybee from Europe and we've brought them here to North America and we put them in these boxes and then we wonder what's wrong with them and trying to figure out, well, how do we mess up or why aren't they doing this or why aren't they doing that? And it's one of these things where we've taken something brought it into an out of context situation. We've developed it, evolved it to make it work to where it is. And then we're trying to figure out, well, now what? There's other things probably in life that we do the same thing, but there, there is something, and maybe it was some of the initial draw that kind of brought folks to bring them here. There is a certain connection that I think you can have with the bees that you can't have with anything else. And this is probably a little bit more on the woo woo side, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Sometimes maybe folks who listen to this podcast are maybe more in tune with maybe thinking a little bit deeper or being in tune with understanding that the more we know, the less we understand kind of a thing with the bees is for whatever reason, I have a, I have a thinking chair and my thinking chair is in my bee yard. It doesn't matter what the issue is. If I go sit in that chair, it's a place to where I, my mind opens up. I can strip my ego and I can find, it seems like answers are almost given to me in those situations with the bees. It's no different, especially when it was issues with the bees that I really can't figure out. You can only do so much YouTubing and Googling and reading, but like anything else, none of it matters um, if it's, it, it only matters if those things apply to your, ex, your is specific and exact context and situation. And you can't really repeat that. There, there is no way to, to find all those answers somewhere else. You have to find it within yourself. You have to find it within your context. In this case, one of the, 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 the most, uh, profound things was I find it in the bee yard when I don't know what's going on. And I acknowledge that, you know what, I don't have the answers. I'm not even sure what to do. And I sit in my chair and I can hear the bees humming and I just kind of focus on that. I focus on the, the, the seeing them coming in out of the beehive. The next thing you know, my mind is just transported somewhere else. And it just almost opens me up to be able to understand things at a level that I normally couldn't. So for me, the bees have a special place and they always will uh, not to try to make them the next big, uh, you know, uh, beekeeping for profit, quit your day job, make a hundred thousand dollars on a third of an acre, raising bees kind of a thing. It's a complete opposite. It's like, let's try to understand by understanding the bees, we can understand ourself. And by understanding ourself, it translates to every other aspect, um, here on the, the farmstead. Um, so bees are kind of special to us. They, they ring true. Um, and it's kind of hard to put really into words that connection. But if you'll notice most folks that are into beekeeping are kind of, um, they're in tune with, with kind of maybe thinking like that. Now you've said in tune and context a couple of different times, which leads me to asking this next question. I was listening to, as I said, some of your older interviews with Tom Domeris and you had said on your first interview with him that life unveils itself as you find that you're living in tune with what you're meant to do. Would you say you've yeah. kind of found where you're meant to be? You found your context. I'm going to be upfront and honest and say, I'm not sure that we're ever actually given the privilege of fully knowing what that really means for us individually. I almost feel like it's once you get good with realizing that this is nothing but a journey towards maybe that, but the goal isn't, the destination, which is cliche, mm-hmm. then I think it does unveil itself. There, there's some, uh, being brought up in a four walled country 
uh, church, you initially have a certain mental approach to life uh, of do's and don'ts. Um, now that I've, that was still a, a fundamental cornerstone uh, in my upbringing, as I've gotten older and I've gotten back to the land, there's another set of, of I don't want to say influence because that can be taken out of context, but once you try to get in tune with nature or get back to the land, try to mimic nature, you see all these things unfolding and developing in nature that you can take those lessons to heart. Mm -hmm. Some ancient cultures, of course, have done that. I know uh, Scott Hebert has um, his, his podcast, Stoic Metal, talking about stoicism and what that means in his life and things like that. There's other forms of ancient philosoph- philosophers and thinking to where that, th- you know, some, if we try to pinpoint what this is, the closer we get to it, you get to it, you get to it. But the second you put your finger on it, it disappears. Mm-hmm. And so it's, there's, there's kind of like this, this feeling that I have where I'm trying to unveil and peel these onions away of who I am, what purpose I have in life and, and what I can do um, in a positive manner to um, help folks and, and be, be the change that you wish to see in the world and be that lighthouse to somebody else. But it's almost as though if I spend too much time focusing on that or thinking about that, it's almost like that light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer to where there's something inherent with realizing we're never going to figure that out or never really know, but to keep heading in that direction and, and do those things to where you are feeling like you're getting, uh, you have, you're, you're being guided or you, you're, you're feeling drawn to those areas. I hate to interrupt um, but be smart here. enough to check it. It's Go ahead. just, this is literally something I was talking about with a buddy of mine recently, that the more time you spend thinking about what I, I'm a, I'm a real big intellectual philosophy guy. I mean, obviously the podcast stuff that I do here, but the more time I spend thinking about what it means for X, Y, Z, what the purpose, what the meaning, what the, what the motives behind the action is, the dimmer that does become, the dimmer the truth mm. behind it comes. Because you know what? You find the truth in the work. You find the truth mm-hmm. in the activity, in the conflict. When it's fleshed out. yeah. When it's yep. fleshed out, you don't find it in sitting and pondering. As important as sitting and pondering can be at times. I'm sorry. I just wanted to interject that. No, well. that that's an excellent point because that that ties right back to our earlier conversation about developing the whys and all these kind of things. You know, our, if you, if you think about our situation, we're like four, at least three, almost four generations removed from any of this knowing mm-hmm. how to do any of these kind of things. But one thing that is inherent in us and who we are is the. Um, the risk taking, the not being afraid to actually go put our hands in the dirt, to grab the shovel, to dig that hole, even if it's not perfectly on contour or that tree is not a permaculture tree or it's not this or it's not that. You just do and you you accept that feedback and you learn and you div- and these things kind of, they unveil themselves to you. You can't do that. You can't start a farm enterprise by saying, I, I shouldn't say that. I can't. Maybe somebody else can. So maybe somebody else can read all the Salatin books can shadow Salatin for a year and then go off and start a successful patry, pastured poultry business. Maybe they can. But for me, I'm wired and I work a little bit differently where I almost need to, to learn the lessons almost the hard way. Or I need to see those lessons in nature. Or I need to learn that lesson. If I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with my bees, how I fix that is finding out what's wrong with me or the cows or something else because there is a spark or there's a a, uh, a life lesson to it that seems to be the answer at that time for whatever problem that I have. And that's not something that you're ever going to gain um, by signing up and going through all these workshops or on YouTube, spending countless hours on you. You know, you just, uh, there has to be a point in time to where you say, okay, enough with this. For me, you know, I was, I was, I was in that mindset where I was going to all the permaculture voices conferences and just, a sponge to all that information. And when I had someone ask me, are you going to, to PV3? And I said, no, I'm no, I'm done. I, it's, it's, I know for me within myself that it's time to actually start doing and whatever, if it's right or if it's wrong, it's, I have that feeling that it's time for me to start doing. And you know, that, you know, person gets upset and they're, you know, they're, they're going through a different thing mentally. 
and you realize, man, this is sometimes you feel like the things that you're doing are completely contrary. They're, they're contrary to the standard American scheme, the American dream, or how most folks do things in regular life. All this is definitely contrary to that. Um, but it's also contrary to the homesteading movement or contrary to the farming movement. Uh, and you don't want to say you're a contrarian because you're always trying to do the opposite thing or mm-hmm. you just have to have a, have a mental process to where you're okay with looking at things completely different and taking action and then seeing where that leads you in your life. Greg, this has been a wonderful conversation. I think that we could go on for eternity talking, which is amazing. <laughs> We're definitely going to have to have you on the show again sometime. Where can people go to learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so right now uh, we're starting a, a new um, kind of place where we put our energy. We're kind of sh- trying to share uh, with video what this means to us, how our family operates and all this. Not so folks can replicate it, but maybe they can also learn some of these same lessons or put them in a place where they can go start to learn those things. They can find us on YouTube um, at The Contrary Farmstead. Uh, they can find us on Instagram, The Contrary Farmstead. Our farm website is Nature's Image Farm. Um, and they can find us on social media at Greg Burns, Susan Burns, and also uh, uh, Nature's Image Farm. And The Contrary Beekeeper Show. And The Contrary Beekeeper Show. Well, thanks again so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me on, Terrence. I appreciate the time. Big thanks to Greg for being on the show. That was a great conversation. You can learn more about Greg and his work by looking up their farm, Nature's Image Farm, and by following their socials. All of that will be linked in the show notes. I also encourage you to check out Greg's podcast, The Contrary Beekeeper Show. Thanks again for listening. Of all the shows in all the towns in all the world, we're glad you chose to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, we kindly ask that you would share the podcast with others, subscribe whatever your podcast player of choice is, and if you'd be so kind to leave us a nice review. Thanks again for listening. This has been Terrence Slayhew and the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast reminding you to keep farming the dreams.